August 2001, Al-Qaeda had hit the Twin Towers in America. Washington was out for revenge. They knew the mastermind Osama bin Laden was in Afghanistan. They also knew the Taliban wouldn't cooperate. So the US decided it's time for war. Just one problem though. Afghanistan was quite far away. Getting jets and bombers there would be a task. The US military settled on these planes, the B-2 bombers. They took off from an Air Force base in Missouri. They would fly across the Pacific to Afghanistan. These planes would kick off America's war. But to reach there, the planes had to refuel. First in California, then in Hawaii, then in Guam, then over the Malacca Strait, and finally in a small Indian Ocean island, the island of Diego Garcia. It became the home base for these bombers. They would drop their load in Afghanistan, return to Diego Garcia, refuel their planes, and then head out for another bombing. This island was crucial to America's war. Some veterans call it the unsinkable carrier. Others call it the island of shame. Because this island's history is steeped in injustices. From colonization to expulsion to occupation, it's the story of how the US and Britain illegally hold on to a foreign island. But how did they get it in the first place? And who does Diego Garcia really belong to? Time for a flashback. Diego Garcia is located in the Indian Ocean, just south of the equator. To its north is the Maldives, to the west is Seychelles, and to the southwest is Mauritius. So it's a very important piece of land. And Diego Garcia isn't an isolated island. It is part of the Chagos Archipelago, one of 60 islands in total. The belief is it was used by Indian and Arab traders. They would sail the Indian Ocean frequently, so Diego Garcia became a pit stop, a place to relax and refresh. Then in the 16th century, it was discovered by Europeans, by this Portuguese sailor. His name was Pedro Mascarenhas. In 1532, he was sailing to the coast of India. That's when he stumbled upon this island. He named it after a Portuguese admiral, Don Garcia de Noronha. Traders knew Diego Garcia was important, but its strategic advantage was not clear yet. That would happen during the colonial race. For most of its history, Diego Garcia was a dependency of Mauritius. So whoever controlled Mauritius controlled Diego Garcia. It changed hands many times. The Dutch came in 1598, the French took over in the early 1700s, and the British in 1810. Among them, the French kicked off settlements. A slave owner in Mauritius was first of the block. His name was Pierre-Marie Lanormand. He noticed a problem among his many slaves. Leprosy was spreading. So he submitted a petition to the French governor of Mauritius. He wanted a settlement in Diego Garcia. He would turn part of the island into a quarantine zone. The rest he would cultivate. In 1783, the French gave permission. La Normand traveled to Diego Garcia with 22 slaves. They found the tropical weather perfect, so they set about developing the island. You soon had fisheries, coconut plantations and cotton cultivation. By 1794, the island was producing its own coconut oil, but then came war. Britain captured Mauritius from France. The Treaty of Paris confirmed British rule over the region, so Diego Garcia switched hands too. At first, nothing changed. The island kept producing plenty of coconut oil, enough to satisfy half of Mauritius. But in the late stages of the 19th century, a big change happened. Steamships entered the picture. Ships that used coal to sail, many of these shipping companies were British. They realized Diego Garcia could be of help. It was located in the middle of the Indian Ocean, so why not turn it into a fueling station? Or as it was called then, a coaling station. The Orient Steam Navigation Company took the lead. They set up Diego Garcia's first coaling station. Soon another company followed, so the island became quite busy. It was blessed with a very large bay, so accommodating ships was not a problem, and thus the island flourished. The residents led a simple but content life. They harvested coconuts, worked at the coaling stations, and made a decent amount of money. Around 90% of the population was Roman Catholic. Bishops from Mauritius would send missionaries to Diego Garcia, so the locals had no reason to leave. Until they were made to. The 20th century was a period of churn and Diego Garcia got the worst of it. After the Second World War, Britain lost its Asian colonies and Mauritius was among them. 
In 1968, the country became independent. Mauritius became independent in 1968, but Britain had been busy behind the scenes. Before granting independence, they issued a new order. Some outlying regions of Mauritius were taken away. They were declared as the British Indian Ocean Territory. And among them was Diego Garcia. Why did Britain do this? Why did they carve up Mauritian land? Some would say, well, that's what they do. But here a bigger game was at play. The 1960s was the second decade of the Cold War. Both the West and the Soviets eyed a big prize, oil. Most of the oil was produced in West Asia. So you needed the Indian Ocean to get that oil out, to ship it across the world. Again, one problem. The West was losing its Indian Ocean presence. By 1956, Britain had been kicked out of Egypt. At the same time, the Soviets were making inroads. There was talk of a Soviet Indian Ocean fleet. So the US wanted a base in the region and Britain obliged. In 1966, they struck a secret deal with the US. Diego Garcia could be used for defense purposes. Again, just one problem. What would happen to the people there? Hundreds of people lived on Diego Garcia. Where would they go? Britain had an answer for that too. Simply remove them. They'd already separated Diego Garcia from Mauritius, so now they told the locals to leave, go to Mauritius or Seychelles. Of course, the islanders refused to do that. Many of them had built their lives in Diego Garcia. It was their homeland. So why would they leave? That's when Britain and the US applied pressure. Forceful expulsion began. Islanders would often leave for treatment or shopping or a holiday, but they were not allowed to return. Also, the number of supply ships was reduced. You see, Diego Garcia was not self-sufficient. It needed food and medicine from the outside, and most of this was shipped in regularly. But Britain and the US reduced these shipments to choke Diego Garcia, so the people there had no option but to leave. By 1973, Diego Garcia was empty. No resident was left on the island. It became a drawing board for the US military. Many of the islanders fled to Mauritius. A few also left for Seychelles and Britain. There they lived as second-class citizens. Britain promised to compensate Mauritius for the loss of territory, but the payments were late and hardly enough. These moves did trigger a lot of outrage, especially among the Indian Ocean countries. The likes of Sri Lanka and later Seychelles opposed it. They said, do not militarize our neighborhood. But the big players did not listen. By the 1980s, Diego Garcia became a full-fledged US military base. And the islanders still fighting for justice. In the 1990s, they filed a lawsuit in Britain. They said, we have been illegally displaced. Please let us return home. And in the year 2000, the court agreed. It said Britain's decision to relocate the islanders was unlawful. Washington and London challenged it, this order. But they lost again in the Court of Appeals. So finally, they approached the House of Lords, where the expected happened. The Lords rejected the islanders' demand, though by now the global sentiment had changed. So Britain expressed regret for its actions. It also granted citizenship to some expelled islanders, but still no permission to return. In 2017, even the United Nations got involved. The General Assembly asked the World Court to sort out the matter, that's the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. And this court too sided with the islanders. Britain's colonization method was declared illegal and London was asked to return Diego Garcia to Mauritius. But spoiler alert. They did not. The court's order was not even binding. It was simply advisory in nature. So Diego Garcia remains in British hands. Some 4,000 US and British soldiers lounge on this island. Meanwhile, its rightful owners remain exiled. They have reluctantly built new lives abroad. Thousands of them live in Britain. They've kept their story alive through music and theater. But is there any hope of them returning home? Not from the looks of it. Mauritius is still asking Britain to return Diego Garcia in exchange. They're promising to allow the U.S. base. Even public opinion is with them. Earlier, British postal stamps were used in the region, but in 2021, the United Nations banned it. They said, use Mauritian stamps instead. Another brave move came the next year. In 2022, a Mauritian diplomat raised his national flag on Chagos Islands. 
and his justification was simple. The British raised flags to claim colonies. He's doing it to reclaim his land. But Mauritius has a long fight ahead. With China now sailing the Indian Ocean, the US and the UK won't give up easily. If anything, the island is more important today. The US and Britain may call Diego Garcia anything they want to, an unsinkable carrier or an island of strategic depth or an outpost in the Indian Ocean. But to history, it will always be a colonial injustice, an island of Western shame. <laughs> Hello and welcome to First Coast America. I'm Eric Hamm, coming to you live from the nation's capital.